WWF and UNESCO on how insurers can support the agenda of protecting World Heritage Sites. Um, this morning, we already had a good webinar uh, that reached our colleagues in um, the Asia Pacific from Japan, Australia, and Africa. And we're happy that we have time for you now to have colleagues from um, the Americas and Europe. So we have folks from Brazil, Costa Rica, Argentina, Canada, the US, and uh, a bunch of countries here in Europe. So thanks to everyone for joining the webinar. Before we start with, um, with the presentation, um, I'm just gonna ask uh, my colleague Olivia Fabry um, here to just, uh, just explain a few technical details to make sure that we run everything smoothly. Hello everyone, so thank you for joining us um, for this webinar. So just a couple of points regarding logistics. Uh, so the panelists are unmuted, but the rest of the participants are automatically muted, so don't start talking. Um, for the panelists, we will be asking you to mute and unmute yourself uh, manually. Uh, but for any participants that wish to ask a question or raise a comment throughout the webinar, you have two different ways of doing this. You can use the text box or the chat box to ask a question in region, or you can raise your hand virtually and we will unmute you and you can take part in the discussion directly. So do not hesitate to do one of those. Um, we will keep on using the chat box to remind you how to do it. And we look forward to, to discussing this with you today. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. So, um, so joining uh, myself, uh, Butch Bakani, and Olivia Fabry here at UN Environment in Geneva, we also have um, colleagues at uh, UNESCO, um, the UNESCO World Heritage Center. So we have Guy uh, de Bonnet in Paris. We also have Alma Roberts from WWF in the UK with the campaigns team there. And we also have Barbara Spiegel in WWF Switzerland who's uh, with the sustainable finance uh, team. Um, so to get ourselves going, we'll start with um, the fundamentals of World Heritage Sites. Um, and so uh, for this uh, segment, uh, we'll be calling on our World Heritage Site expert, um, Guy, uh, to um, explain to us um, the basics of, of World Heritage Sites. Guy? Uh, thank you, Butch, Butch and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, join this webinar. And uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody on this uh, on this webinar. Uh, so my name is Guy de Bonnet. I work in uh, UNESCO at the World Heritage Center, which is the secretariat to the World Heritage Convention. And uh, I think most of you have heard about uh, uh, the World Heritage Convention and especially the World Heritage Site. As you know, the, uh, since 1972, uh, the World Heritage Convention has been adopted by the state parties of UNESCO with the objective to, to uh, conserve or to give an international conservation status to some of the most important cultural and natural sites we have in this world. And uh, today we have a, a, a growing list of sites. Uh, we have a, a little bit more than 1,000 sites inscribed on this World Heritage List. Um, many are cultural sites, uh, monuments or historic cities, or also cultural landscapes, but we have also a significant part of uh, natural sites, around uh, 200 plus uh, sites on the list are inscribed because of their natural values. Um, and these include sites like the Great Barrier Reef or Lake Baikal or the Serengeti, or the Grand Canyon, so, so some of the most important and most significant uh, natural places in this world. Uh, next slide, please. Can I get the next slide? Yes, thank you. So, as I mentioned, the convention was uh, adopted in 1972. Uh, this was uh, shortly after the uh, first environmental convention, the environmental global environmental meeting, which was held in Stockholm, the Stockholm meeting of the human environment which I think for the first time really uh, uh, made people realize that uh, to tackle environmental issues, we, need, we needed global instruments and we needed a global dialogue to address some of these issues which cannot, which cannot be addressed by, uh, at national level only. Uh, and one of these instruments that was 
adopted in the wake of this is important convention was the, the World Heritage Convention, which was adopted a few months after the Stockholm Convention at the uh, UNESCO General Assembly. Today, this is an almost universally ratified convention. We have uh, at this stage uh, 193 countries, which we call state parties, that have ratified the convention. Um, and this makes it one of the most widely recognized international agreements. Uh, in fact, we have also uh, all the major countries in the world. So for the moment, there are also only some small island states, mainly some small island states in the Pacific, who have not yet uh, uh, ratified the convention. What is also interesting is that this convention um, is both for the protection of natural sites and the protection of cultural sites. And in fact, if you look at the history of the convention, it, it, it came about uh, as a result of two separate initiatives. One, one was an initiative mainly led by France to, uh, to have an inter international instrument to protect some of the most important monuments uh, at international level. And pa in parallel, there was an uh, initiative mainly led actually by the American uh, government. Um, and. Uh, which uh, wanted to uh, ensure there would, would be an, an international protection status for some of the most important national parks at that stage uh, in the world. So these two initiatives uh, came together and uh, uh, were developed into one convention, the World Heritage uh, Convention. And uh, it's actually also interesting that uh, the natural sites are um, given a place in, in a convention that is actually dealing with heritage, uh, because I think it's, uh, this gives a recognition that um, uh, we as a human species, we, we consider that not only uh, some of the cultural uh, monuments or the historic places that we are, have made ourselves during our uh, long history on this planet uh, are part of our heritage, but that actually the natural world surrounding us uh, is also part of our of our own uh, heritage, which we want to transmit to uh, future generations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, no, you went too quickly. One back. Yes. So uh, the convention is an, uh, a formal international legal instrument. Uh, the countries uh, sign up to this uh, convention. The most important instrument of the convention is the World Heritage List. So um, the convention has several uh, um, governing mechanisms. We have uh, every two years the General Assembly when all the countries uh, that have signed up to the convention meet and discuss uh, issues. But also they elect the World Heritage Committee, which is uh, co composed of 21 uh, member states state parties to the con convention. And these are making uh, uh, all decisions on uh, the inscription of sites and also look at the state of conservation of existing sites on the, on the World Heritage List. The convention has also a set of guidelines, which we call operational guidelines, a set of rules that govern uh, uh, the convention. These uh, rules describe the process for inscribing sites on the World Heritage List. They talk about the role of advisory bodies. We have three different advisory bodies which provide scientific advice to the World Heritage Committee for uh, their decision making. Uh, but it has also other kinds of aspects like uh, modification of site boundaries. Uh, sites when they are inscribed, they have an international status. So it's important that they are clearly delimited. And if there is a change to these sites, uh, this, uh, this change also has to be approved by the World Heritage Committee. And I think the most important aspect of this convention is that it doesn't stop at listing the, the site, but it also has an important mechanism to ensure that the state of conservation of sites is monitored and uh, that uh, states are, are fulfilling their commitments in terms of the conservation of, of these sites. And the World Heritage Committee can uh, discuss the state of conservation of all the sites on the list when there are issues, but can also decide to put sites on the list in danger, which is kind of a, a warning mechanism to say that uh, these sites are, in, uh, are being threatened and could lose the reasons why they are on the World Heritage List. And eventually, it would also, it's also possible for the committee to delist sites if uh, they are not uh, no longer having the values for which they were originally inscribed. Uh, luckily, this has only so far happened twice in the, in the lifetime of the convention. 
Uh, the next uh, slide, please. So the, the really basic uh, concept behind the World Heritage Convention is what we call in the, in, the, in the language of the convention, outstanding universal value. Basically sites are, are the World Heritage List uh, has the, the, the objective of, of uh, uh, a list of the most important and the most significant cultural and natural uh, uh, places in the world. And you, you see on the slide a quite elaborate definition on what outstanding universal value means. But if you look at the, the, the terminology, Basically, for, to be inscribed on the World Heritage List, sites have to demonstrate certain values, and we have 10 criteria uh, that determine these values. There are four natural criteria and six cultural criteria, and in terms of natural sites, we talk about biodiversity, we talk about importance as ecosystems, we talk about um, geological importance, and also uh, outstanding uh, phenomena, for example, um, important landscapes. Um, so, so there are these clear values that have to be demonstrated and these values have to be shown to be outstanding at universal level. So the philosophy of this list is really to have a list of the most important sites where uh, uh, all the countries in the world agree that these sites are of, of, uh, of this outstanding universal value and therefore that it's a common um, objective and a common um, a duty to protect these sites uh, for the entire uh, humankind kind, and also for future generations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, of course, uh, we believe that the convention is much more than a, a conservation convention. It's of course primarily a conservation uh, convention, but it also links up to sustainable development. The World Heritage Committee a few years ago decided on a, a sustainable development strategy, uh, which lays out how uh, World Heritage sites uh, contribute to sustainable development. And uh, this is also expressed, of, of course, uh, uh, with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are kind today as the, the common global agenda uh, for the world. And uh, of course, World Heritage sites contribute to, to several of these uh, uh, sustainable development goals. For natural sites, the most evident ones are uh, the goal on, the, on the, the conservation of terrestrial or the conservation of marine uh, uh, biodiversity, life on earth and life on the water. Uh, but of course, uh, World Heritage sites often also have uh, economic uh, important values and also can contribute to other, uh, other sustainable development goals. Uh, for the coastal sites, we have also a direct link to uh, to um, uh, goal 11 on sustainable uh, cities and communities. And it's interesting to see that under uh, sustainable development goal number 11, there is a specific target on world heritage, which actually asks the world to ensure that the, the world natural and cultural heritage sites are, are better protected. Next slide, please. So this sounds all very uh, rosy and nice. Unfortunately, in spite of the, the global recognition of the importance of this site uh, um, and, and the recognition and the commitment of countries uh, signing up to the convention and proposing sites for inscription on the, on, on the World Heritage List, uh, this doesn't spare these sites from uh, also being threatened. And uh, some of these uh, threats are linked to global phenomena, of course, climate change being probably at this stage the most important one. Climate change is having profound impact on uh, many of the world heritage sites, both the cultural and the, and the natural sites. But uh, apart from, from these global uh, uh, phenomena, uh, we have quite a number of sites that are threatened by very specific uh, threats which can range from uh, illegal exploitation of natural resources. For natural sites, we often think of illegal logging or uh, uh, poaching or um, uh, overfishing for marine sites. But also increasingly, there are real issues with um, uh, infrastructure project and other uh, industrial activities and development type uh, activities. Uh, in a world where uh, resources become scarcer and scarcer and, and uh, where uh, there is a growing population, pressure on these sites is also mounting everywhere. 
and uh, uh, this is a, a big uh, concern. Of course, countries, by proposing sites to the World Heritage List, take on a commitment for the protection of these sites, uh, and that is a commitment which is a national commitment. At the same time, we can see that often uh, this commitment is, uh, is, is not always um, very much uh, uh, known at, uh, at, at the national governments, uh, whilst it's often the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry of Environment who proposes sites and who is in charge of the management of these sites. Uh, there are other uh, uh, economic priorities for countries which sometimes are in conflict with the conservation, with the commitment for conservation of the sites that have been taken on by this, uh, by, by this very same government. So, so um, the, as I mentioned, the World Heritage Convention is looking into these issues and uh, the World Heritage Committee every year discusses the state of conservation of uh, World Heritage sites and uh, all the sites where there are uh, some of these serious uh, issues and in many cases we also have been uh, able to, to address some of these uh, issues and I think uh, later in the presentation there will be some examples of that. Um, but uh, uh, I think it's also increasingly clear that uh, we cannot depend just on the commitment made by governments to uh, uh, conserve uh, the World Heritage Sites. And while, of course, the Convention is a legal instrument between countries, I think the idea of uh, conserving our common world heritage is, is, is much more of a broader commitment for the humankind as a whole. And therefore, I think it's important to increasingly enlist also uh, local communities and the general public in their conservation of uh, these sites. And I think also increasingly it's important to ensure that private sector uh, buys into to, to this. We have here a situation where we have uh, uh, a limited number of, of, of sites. We, uh, if we talk about the world natural world heritage sites, we're talking about 247 sites, which although they do represent more than 10% of the protected areas in the world, they cover still less than 1% of, of the earth. And uh, so it's a limited number of sites, but a, a number of sites whose global value has given the highest, uh, has been given the highest recognition. And therefore, I think it's very important to ensure that also uh, a private sector increasingly uh, buys into this uh, concept and, and takes also joins in the responsibility to uh, protect these sites. And I think the next slide is on the questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Guy. I think just a, just a quick comment also to say that I think what you pointed out about um, this, there is a government responsibility here, but increasingly there's also an agenda uh, for the private sector. And it's exactly the same narrative that we've seen with other um, global uh, agreements, be it the 1987 Montreal Protocol on ozone, on the ozone layer, or what we're trying to do with the Paris Agreement. Originally, an intergovernmental agenda, but increasingly also a private sector agenda. And I think the, um, the link on, on uh, biodiversity and ecosystems is really strong. I mean, the, um, uh, the, the latest science shows that addressing biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation is as important as fighting the agenda of greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, and they are inextricably linked. I think it's um, a lot of things that are very relevant as we speak right now, and thank you so much for um, um, clarifying the fundamentals of, of this uh, agenda of World Heritage Sites. We have time for questions now to make sure that we, um, you, you can um, ask questions along the way and not just towards the end. So we'll pause now for any questions. It seems um, clear um, so far. So uh, thank you, Guy. And obviously this is not, um, uh, only uh, the only time for you to ask questions. There's also post webinar. Um, the team would be happy to answer any questions, and we'll be happy to reach out to UNESCO and Guy also if you have any follow up questions later on. Let's move on to um, the next slide. And at this point, um, I'm going to call on Alma Roberts from WWF UK to explain why WWF got involved in this. 
Alma. Yes, thank you very much and thank you everyone for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is Alma Roberts and I'm with the campaigns team at WWF UK. Um, and so just to give an introduction or context on why WWF has been working on this, I'm going to take you back to um, 2013-14 um, and this this comes from WWF got involved in protecting war heritage sites when we found out that a British oil company called Soko uh, had decided to drill inside the Virunga National Park, which is a war heritage site in the DRC. So in October of 2013, uh, we filed a complaint against this company, Soko, um, under the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises. Um, the company's commitment came following a mediation uh, between two parties as, as part of this process. Um, luckily, we, we, uh, with, with this mediation process and the pressure that we, we put together, uh, Soko withdrew from the Virunga National Park after um, concluding its current operation, um, its, its operational activities within the park that included seismic testing in the Lake Edward. Um, within that, the company pledged not to drill for oil, oil in the park, and this is something that WWF warned as, uh, as a potential environmental damage, a severe envir environmental damage. Um, the work that we also did, aside from doing this mediation process with SOCO, um, we also engaged uh, with the financial institutions um, in order to get traction on the investment and also move, uh, we put together a, a full-time ad in the Financial Times, which is shown on the right side of the slide. And the blue uh, sign that we see right now is actually something that SOCO uh, let announced, when they announced that they were going to be withdrawing from Virunga National Park, they made a very um, loud statement that this process had been very expensive and a painful experience that they would not wish to re repeat, which shows that um, a, what a company uh, can have a, a potential risk or repu reputational risk by going into these, these sites and how expensive this could actually be. If we can move to the next slide, please. So um, WWF is not the only person who actually um, um, holds a position into going into these sites. Uh, the World Heritage Committee also has a clear and consistent position on extractive operations. And um, in 2014, the committee uh, responded to HSBC after they launched their policy on work heritage sites. And this policy uh, was put together in consultation with the WWF. Can we move to the next slide, please? From the Veronga uh, campaign um, and the kind of uh, engagement that we had with investors, we also were able to uh, get some data in um, from from different process that we have in, in inside WWF. And as of September of 2015, this data showed us that the fastest growing threat to work heritage sites is actually this extractive activity. And um, the slide is now showing you how it actually shows uh, throughout the continents. Um, and from that data, um, we published a report in the spring of 2016, which actually helped us launch a, a campaign on protecting war heritage sites. And in this report, um, we were able to let let people know uh, that half of these natural war heritage sites were threatened by harmful industrial activities as guy said that they such things exist and these ones are mainly coming from oil mining and gas but also this report showed that 11 million people living in or near uh, war heritage sites depending on on these for food water medicine and jobs 
Can we move to the next slide, please? When we launched this campaign, it, it, it was very well received by the media, as we're showing right now um, on the slides all over the world, uh, really also expressing concern about the protection of these sites and the importance for, for everybody, and not necessarily governments, but also um, companies to make sure that they, they, they protect these sites for future generations to come. And as I expressed, uh, we launched a campaign, and within that campaign, we used the flagship of um, three countries: Belize, um, Bel sorry, Belize, uh, Tanzania, and Spain. Um, they have war heritage sites, so Belize has the Belize Barrier Reefs, uh, Tanzania has the Salou um, Game Reserve, and Doñana National Park in Spain. All of these three flagship campaigns uh, were under threats. Belize Barrier Reef uh, had an issue with um, oil exploration. Salou Game Reserve, one of the main reasons why um, it was uh, listed as in danger by UNESCO, it's uh, the poaching for elephants, but um, other issues as in mining, as well as the current issue of a hydropower project um, are also putting in danger this site. And then Doñana, a national park, had the uh, danger of um, river dredging. And um, within the campaign, we were able to mobilize over 1.1 million people to take advocacy actions to prime ministers, presidents, and businesses. And we're happy to uh, share some of the outcomes uh, for Spain, Doñana, uh, we were able to cancel the dredging plants that threatened this park. For Belize Barrier Reef, we were able to work with the government and to, to introduce a permanent oil moratorium in the Belizean waters. Um, for Tanzania, the government has banned any form of mining inside the property. Although, as I mentioned, uh, there is currently a very uh, intense threat with the hydropower project uh, called the Stigler Scorch. And we were also able to engage with the finance institutions and we were able to get 13 additional global banks to uh, develop or improve their policies and have them shared with the um, World Heritage Center. And moving on to the next slide, I would like to invite my colleague Barbara to um, share with you a little bit of our work with finance institutions and how um, this relates to, um, to you in the industry. Thank you, Alma. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barbara Spiegel. I'm with WWF Switzerland uh, in the sustainable finance area. Uh, I just want to give you a little bit more uh, detail around a case study we did with uh, within this Doniana National Park. Um, basically, this is a company called Grupo Mexico. Uh, they're the fourth largest copper producer in the world, but also uh, extract lead, silver, zinc, and gold, and have some other um, infrastructure uh, activities as well. They're operating mostly in North, uh, Central, and South America. And this specific case study on Doniana National Park, I'd just like to give you a little bit more detail detail um, what actually happened there. Um, back in 1998, there was um, a burst of a dam um, of the Los Frailes mines, um, which are basically very near to Sevilla um, in Spain. And that uh, burst of the dam caused one of the worst ecological disasters in the history of Spain. Um, what happened is that almost 2 billion gallons of contaminated water uh, were flowing down the river. Um, that water was highly acidic. It was um, mixed with um, arsenic and cadmium and other waste materials. Um, and basically the, what resulted was um, more than 25,000 kilograms of dead fish and uh, t about 2,000 uh, dead birds. Um, and of course, the cleanup activities from an economic perspective uh, were quite large. They were in the range of 240 million euros uh, to clean up um, this bursting dam and the, the impact of it. Now, uh, these Los Frailes mines are about 45 kilometers 
outside the Doniana National Park. So this is an example of an activity and an accident um, very close to, the, to a border uh, of a World Heritage Site um, and shows that even you know, if, if such activities are within the periphery of such sites, there can still be an impact. Um, basically, uh, what happened um, years later, uh, this group of Mexico, um, when, when the Andalusian government decided to go for public bidding again in this, in this same area where this accident had happened in 98, a few years ago they reopened it for public bidding and Grupo Mexico was actually awarded uh, a project uh, that they started uh, basically um, they started to uh, do certain mining activities again in 2016 and over the next four years um, they will be investing 220 million euros again to basically uh, open up that area again and the full um, commercial activity currently is expected to start in 2020 again. Um, the same group of Mexico uh, companies also um, currently um, involved in mining in the Monarch Butterfly Reserve um, in, in Mexico. Um, what happened there is actually that this company had a mine um, that it operated till 1992. Um, it was then closed and um, years later in 2008, UNESCO declared it a World Heritage Site. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that just a year or two earlier, uh, again, the mine basically was reopened and Grupo Mexico claimed it was never truly really closed and they should have the right uh, to keep uh, mining there. So these are, it's just a, one example of one company, not to, to blackmail just one, but it's simply one case study that we chose uh, to show today. Uh, the other example on the next slide please, that I wanted to briefly show you is um, the Zeleuz Game Reserve in Tanzania, which Alma already briefly mentioned. Um, the Zeleuz Game Reserve is um, a World Heritage Site since 1992. It's actually a very magnificent site. It has um, some of the most significant concentrations of African elephants, uh, black rhinoceros, hippopotamus, giraffes, and cheetahs. Um, in terms of the size, it's about the size of Denmark, and it's one of the few remaining examples uh, of, of an area that's really largely uninhabited and undisturbed. Um, in, in 2009, there was a legislative revision um, which allowed extractive concessions again, and um, then following that, there was, uh, as a result, um, quite a, a number of extractive activities sanctioned. Um, what you can see on this on this screen is um, or on this slide is a screenshot of a WWF internal um, uh, GIS information tool. Uh, what you can see in green is basically the World Heritage Site of the Zeleuz Game Reserve and what you can see uh, with the yellows and reds are different active um, mines or granted concessions. So through this tool, um, what WDF, WF has been able to find out is that there's actually still five active mines and over 50 mining concessions directly in that game reserve. Now the government has recently pledged again, as Alma said, to remove all these mines, which is a wonderful news, but again, the very same government um, uh, the Ministry of Finance is planning or is actively seeking funding for the Stiegler Scorch, which is a, a very, very large hydro dam um, that's currently being planned um, to provide energy. And uh, WWF, again, has, has created quite significant um, uh, public information around that uh, project. We believe it's a very bad project and there will be lots of alternatives uh, for other energy provision for the country. Um, now moving on to the next slide, um, why is it that you know we decide as a as a society um, with this um, UNESCO uh, convention that we want to actually protect these sites, which really cover less than one percent of our Earth, 
and yet we find extractive activities and oil and gas activities there. So really it's three factors uh, we find. Um, not surprisingly, it's not one one company or one person or one government alone, it's really the combination of all. So it's, it's really governments that are actively seeking uh, for companies to come in and to drill because of course there's always a financial incentive there. And while, you know, governments, um, we had a, a brief discussion on this in the earlier call this morning, governments, the, the environmental department of a government may want to protect certain sites, but um, there may be certain disagreements within governments themselves because of certain economic gain um, that they uh, receive by nevertheless allowing extractive activities in protected areas. Then, of course, it's the companies themselves, the oil, gas, mining companies and others uh, who are either um, simply ignorant, meaning they don't know about the protected status, or they're unconcerned. Uh, again, where economic uh, gain uh, just outweighs the environmental um, considerations. And lastly, and of course, most importantly for our call today, it's financial institutions. And of course, this is banks, it's investors in general, and also insurance companies, of course, who often unwittingly find themselves either lending, insuring, or investing in such projects. And this is exactly basically what we're hoping to start changing uh, with this campaign. Um, uh, going to the next slide, um, just briefly how we how we got to the journey now to uh, kick off uh, this kind of insurance journey together with our colleagues from the UNIPFI, PSI and UNESCO. The, the very starting point was this SOCO company that Alma told you about. Um, after quite heavy engagement with that company and the various investors involved around that, um, we published uh, two different reports. One was called Safeguarding Outstanding Natural Value in collaboration with the Church of England and then another one, How Banks Can Safeguard Our World Heritage. Um, both of these reports are available online if you wanna if you wanna Google them. Basically what these reports did is we worked directly together with um, various banks at that time to find out how could they strengthen their internal policies around protecting World Heritage sites. Of course, there's a lot of um, uh, restrictions or, or guidance already out there through the equator print principles, but we also wanted to make sure that um, you know good policies really cover general lending, etc. So these reports are all around um, policies, how you can strengthen them, how you can better implement them. Um, and now, after you know focusing on investors and banks, we'd really like to kickstart this journey also together with insurance companies, because we believe you have. Um, a very important role to play in this. Not only are many of you large institutional investors, but obviously your uh, risk managers. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we'll get into just in just a moment, we'll get to how exactly you can help us protect these important sites. Um, any questions at this point in time? Thanks, Barbara. So the floor is open for um, questions. Okay, so I think it's um, crystal so far. Um, uh, thanks, um, uh, Alma and Barbara, for explaining uh, WWF's uh, journey on this. And it has been a real journey, uh, I have to say. Um, the next slide, uh, please. So this is where um, the PSI comes into the picture and the insurance industry. Um, the, the agenda that WWF started uh, with companies and investors and banks has moved on to the insurance industry. And, and we felt that this was an, uh, a very interesting time to actually, uh, some uh, PSI members also had uh, uh, raised this as a, a key issue uh, uh, for them. And we thought it was a, an excellent opportunity to actually join forces on, on this agenda. Uh, the novelty with the PSI engagement is that it is a, a collaborative initiative that you know uh, the entire PSI membership can uh, be part of. 
uh, it's not simply a company, uh, one company, individual company approach, but really a collaborative initiative. And we felt that one of the best moments actually for um, to launch this initiative was at the 42nd session of the World Heritage Committee, which happened in Manama in Bahrain last July. So that um, many of you are already familiar with the climate change process. So the big meeting happening this year in, in Poland is uh, the UN Climate Change Conference, and that's an annual process. So the World Heritage Committee also have their own conference of the parties. It's basically this one the, that happens uh, that happened recently in Bahrain. So that was the moment for us to actually launch this initiative. And this one was also it's also a complete initiative because we are looking at the entirety of the influence of the insurance industry across risk management, um, insurance, and investment. And and I think as a solid sign of a collaboration, it's not, it's not simply insurers coming uh, forward, but also in partnership with UNESCO and also with WWF. Next slide, please. So if you uh, boil down into what are the five goals of the statement of commitment, um, the first one uh, really is uh, a data and knowledge goal. Uh, we know that uh, there are data gaps there, for example, on environment protected areas and environmental data sets, but also uh, development data sets, for example, on mining concessions. And also just um, the things that Guy had explained earlier, not everyone, probably people are aware about UNESCO and the World Heritage Sites, but not everyone is uh, familiar with the convention and the operating guidelines behind it. Um, so this is one, the goal one is really um, the aspiration to know as much as possible on this agenda, to be well informed so that you can make more uh, informed decisions on this issue. The second one really is an awareness raising goal. So for if you are a PSI member, everyone signed on to the four principles and principle three says you will work together with governments, regulators and other key stakeholders to promote widespread action. So on environmental, social, and governance issues. So this is simply, goal two is simply a World Heritage Site version of that principle, where you're applying the concept of uh, raising awareness on World Heritage Sites across the agenda of clients and business parties and government. It also shows that this is not simply an insurance industry issue, but a wider whole of society issue where everyone needs to chime in and get involved. The third goal um, is really um, what I would say is the prevention goal. And this is what is also very much in line with the whole risk management philosophy within insurance uh, of understanding and, and, and preventing and reducing risk. Um, and what is the what are ways that the insurance industry um, um, can do to address this? So for example, I mean, the fact that you, uh, you have signed the PSI or the Principles for Responsible Investment are really good overarching starting points to get deeper into this agenda. Some companies um, have developed their own World Heritage Site policies. Uh, I think you already saw earlier that Barclays and Standard uh, Chartered are a couple of banks that have developed their own policies um, and also certain guidelines and processes as well. So this is really the agenda is how, mu how much, what, to what extent can insurers do within their core activities that would uh, actually prevent or reduce the risk of insuring um, and investing in companies or projects which could damage uh, these sites. Um, the fourth goal is really the uh, protection goal. Uh, what are the things that insurers can do to really uh, protect World Heritage Sites? For example, the use of risk analytics and risk modeling. Um, that's not simply limited to uh, the damage function to buildings, but also looking at the value of wetlands, the value of coral reefs, um, the value of forests, for example, in the whole um, risk analytic, um, um, uh, risk analytic uh, modeling um, agenda. Uh, what are insurance products that could be developed? Obviously, property is um, um, uh, an easy one, but there's also environmental impairment liability, environmental pollution liability. There's also insurance for ecosystems. 
um, um, that could be uh, looked into. And obviously that also applies to um, investments as well. And both insurance and investments could also look into low carbon technologies, which actually could benefit World Heritage sites in terms of a reduction in air pollution. And obviously we know that carbon emissions, for example, lead to um, uh, um, ocean acidification, which affect, for example, marine um, um, uh, World Heritage sites and, and coral reefs like what we're seeing, for example, the Great Barrier Reef is an example where we already know that because of rapid and constant bleaching, already as it is right now, half of the Great Barrier Reef is dead because of uh, the warming waters um, in that area. And then obviously the, the last goal, uh, aspiration, is um, the capacity of insurers to engage with companies that you insure or invest in. Um, and to not only on you know to understand better um, the risks that might be associated with their activities through disclosure, but also actually encouraging them to adopt um, uh, and adhere to industry standards which are beneficial in protecting world heritage sites. So a, a good example is the fact that the mining um, industry members of the International Council of Mining and Metals have made a no-go commitment that applies to all their members, preventing extractive industry activities in the World Heritage Sites. So that's something we think that insurers, for example, can um, encourage um, uh, companies to do if there are sector or industry standards that could be adopted that could help protect these sites. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, an example of a, a company that has taken this agenda as part of a broad sustainability framework is actually Swiss Re. Um, Swiss Re is one of the first um, uh, insurers in the world to actually publicly come out with a sustainability risk, risk framework covering environmental, social, and governance issues that applies to both insurance and investment activities. And you can see here that this is not purely an environmental one, but also covers a social dimension, in particular human rights in terms of policies. And they have actually gone uh, deeper into looking at uh, sectors where we, they believe guidelines for their insurance and investment transactions are actually very relevant and helpful. Next slide, please. So an example uh, there are, is their um, position on dams, where you can see here that the concern is not simply about the destruction of local habitat, but also uh, poor living and working conditions, uh, labor rights, um, um, and uh, human rights that, that may be violated in the context of these uh, projects. And you can also see the reference to cultural heritage um, and in particular UNESCO sites and uh, potential impact on local biodiversity. So that's very specific, for example, on what uh, Swiss Re is looking into as far as dams. Um, the next slide is also another example where um, they are citing their position on mining, uh, which has already been highlighted by our colleagues from WWF in terms of um, as one of the main issues uh, as far as natural world heritage sites is concerned. And once again, here you can see that um, alongside issues like child labor uh, and you know making sure that there's free prior and informed consent from local communities um, on certain projects is the the link to uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites and protected areas and actually protected areas are is a wider agenda than uh, World Heritage Sites um, so they're already going into even though it's not a World Heritage Site, as long as it's a protected area, they're also looking into that as well. If we go to the next slide, um, it will also show that over time, Swiss Re has developed a, a process internally. And this is something uh, on that triggers a process in terms of looking at their um, insurance and investment transactions and how this is addressed um, within their company. And I was actually quite impressed because I, I know that this framework is, um, 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 led in uh, the Zurich headquarters of Swiss Re. But if you go to Brazil and talk to the Swiss Re Brazilian underwriter, they are actually part of the, the implementation. They are aware of this. Uh, if you go to Swiss Re Americas, they're also aware 
of, of what this framework is all about. So there is, um, but this is not something that did, that um, uh, didn't happen um, overnight. Um, so it's a it's a process has been a process for Swiss Re. I know because uh, they've been they were uh, we were discussing this with Swiss Re also um, at least eight years ago probably when they were just uh, looking into this and that's how time has actually helped Swiss Re become more sophisticated with their approach in this agenda. Next slide, please. Um, and they already have. Um, accumulated some statistics on one of the most common things that are referred by um, their uh, insurance and investment practitioners. And it's not surprising that um, issues like uh, relating to mining, oil and gas and dams are some of the main ones that are often referred um, internally for Swiss Re and that's something that they are managing um, all the time. So obviously this is not something that um, um, uh, any company is already doing uh, already. It took some time for Swiss Re to do this, uh, but in, if you talk to Swiss Re, they actually would like as many peers as possible to be be able to uh, get into this and join them because this is not simply a Swiss Re agenda um, or, or others. And we know that um, some of you on the call and others on the PSI already have developed similar frameworks. And, and this is the reason why we think this is an opportune time um, to get a collaborative agenda on this. Next slide, please. And one of the links to the PSI activities that we're doing is that's very relevant to this agenda is the fact that uh, led by Allianz, we now have a global initiative to develop global guidance for non-life insurance underwriters on um, ESG issues. Um, such as um, uh, pollution, heritage sites, child labor, etc. This is something that we are already working on. We have interviewed um, underwriters around the world in this agenda. We have uh, put this forward in PSI events around the world. You have taken part in the global survey on ESG issues. Uh, and all of this will culminate at an event in Allianz in Munich on Feb 27 next year, where we will launch these guidance. And we believe uh, very specific issues that uh, members have put forward on the table, like World Heritage Sites, would actually contribute um, in terms of the specific guidance on certain issues that would help um, insurers around the world have uh, shape an, uh, a position uh, on, on, on certain issues. Next slide, please. And uh, the agenda on underwriting is not only the initiative that's relevant to the PSI. We, um, I was with um, a number of you um, in, in Canada um, um, recently when we launched the insurance industry development tools for cities in Montreal. Um, and uh, Guy already mentioned that um, there's a even a specific um, sustainable development goal 11 that's really relevant in terms of making cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, which has a very specific target on protecting natural and cultural heritage. So if you go to the next slide, we, we know that one of the goals that we've shaped with insurers and with mayors and local governments around the world is a specific goal on natural and cultural heritage sites. And we know that this is also something that cross cuts because if you talk about climate and disaster resilience, for example, beyond um, um, gray infrastructure like um, 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 uh, gray infrastructure like flood defenses, you also have um, um, natural infrastructure that could be used like wetlands and coral reefs that are effective in, in buffering storm surge and wave energy. Um, so these are some things that are actually cross-cutting when you look at a wider agenda within the PSI community. N the next slide. Um, so what does signing this statement of commitment mean? So this is really, um, bottom line is that this is the starting point uh, for many. It's actually, you should look at it in the same way that you signed the principles for sustainable insurance. Um, the the P, signing the PSI is really a work in progress and a direction to head in. It doesn't mean that you need to go through all the possible actions under each principle, make sure everyone complies with it, and then you sign the PSI. That's not the agenda. 
the agenda is to say like we support this agenda and we want to take action through the aspirational goals that I explained earlier. And it's exactly the same premise that we are applying for this World Heritage Site commitment. So, um, so we also know the complexity of the insurance business, whether it's investments across asset classes and also simply the thousands of insurance and reinsurance transactions. How do you deal with these things in reinsurance transactions that are covered in treaty arrangements? where there's a lot of sessions that one cannot really look into on a per risk basis, unlike facultative reinsurance, for example. Um, and that's not, uh, the idea really is to make sure to start a process um, within your companies instead of what are the things that we should do to inform ourselves so that we actually are able to prevent um, um, activities and transactions that actually undermine and could damage World Heritage Sites. That is really the idea behind it. And we believe that the, the best way to do this is to work collaboratively. Otherwise, a single company doing an entire exercise on World Heritage Sites would take an enormous amount of effort. Right now, it's not only the opportunity for you to work with your peers across the insurance industry, but also to work with UNESCO and WWF on this agenda. So there's actually, a, this is a real collaboration where um, civil society, uh, the UN and the insurance industry can actually come together and say, we support this agenda and we can work on this agenda more effectively together. The next slide, please. So we already have um, um, insurers and stakeholders who have stepped up to the plate and say, we support this agenda um, on risk management, insurance and investment, uh, and we would like to work with the PSI, uh, UNESCO and WWF in further advancing this agenda um, at the international level. Um, next slide, please. And so the the process is simple and the categories are simply the same for the PSI membership categories. There's a category to sign as company. So these are insurers and reinsurers, brokers, and also firms that provide services um, to insurance and reinsurance companies or brokers such as risk modeling firms. That's category one. Uh, category two are really supporting institutions. Uh, national insurance associations. If you are an insurance regulator, you can also show your support for this. Uh, if you are part of civil society and are engaging with this also with insurers, you can also sign and, 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 uh, and support this. There's no fee involved, so you're not expected to pay any uh, fee uh, for this. So it's simply a, sh uh, a, a confirmation of support that we're seeking. And the process is simple. All you need to do is email us uh, through PSI uh, World Heritage at unify.org and tell us that your company would like to sign the, the statement. And uh, we've made sure uh, because of various requests from membership that, you know, at least because of the holidays in the Northern Hemisphere, to give ample time for people post August and even September to go uh, until the end of October to give people time to go through their internal processes to make sure that uh, you can get um, uh, opportunity to be recognized as a founding signatory. We will be uh, promoting, uh, doing a lot of comms around this in November. So from now, um, now that we're in mid-September, we you basically have one and a half months um, um, to um, become a founding signatory. Uh, and be part of this. Um, the next slide, please. So what are the things that we're going to do? So obviously, this uh, webinars are a tool we may do later on, depending on the demand from members. On If we go into further details, for example, we can do something more specific on analytics. We can do something on insurance products. We can do something on investment allocations, et cetera investment analysis. Um, so that's um, on the table. Um, also, what's very interesting is that we have commitment from WWF and UNESCO to help to work together with insurers in developing guidance 
the statement is not guidance per se. It could be viewed as some broad guidance, but ultimately we recognize that the insurance business has its peculiarities. So people would need to understand how does it really boil down when I underwrite risk? What are the things that I should uh, be doing? What are the things that I should be mindful of? What's a checklist that might be helpful? Um, and we've done something like this already, for example, with um, Oceana, whom we work with on in developing the first ever uh, marine uh, insurance statement on tackling illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. So there was a statement of commitment that was launched last year at the Our Ocean Conference, and that was an expression of support in tackling uh, illegal uh, pirate fishing. And now beyond that statement, we are actually have just finalized um, uh, Oceana has uh, just finalized with us and we've consulted marine insurers um, a set of uh, first ever global risk management guidelines for marine insurers uh, in tackling pirate fishing. And that's a thing that we can also uh, conceivably do for the World Heritage Site agenda. In addition to that, what are the tools that could be developed um, uh, that could be tailored for investment uh, practitioners and insurance underwriters within insurance companies. We know that there are existing internal tools for WWF called SITE that they use where they have um, environmental and uh, development data sets and they can have a visual representation of um, overlap uh, mining concessions overlapping with World Heritage Sites. We also know that there's the integrated biodiversity assessment tool, but that's being used by some companies uh, like Allianz, for example, in looking at um, the agenda of ecosystems and biodiversity and their business transactions. Uh, but by far and large, there's no tool that's really tailored for insurance business um, uh, out there yet. And so that's something that we could explore because ultimately, uh, underwriters and investment managers need tools uh, to help them do their job um, in assessing um, this agenda. And as I mentioned earlier also, uh, we have the backing of um, UNESCO behind this. So we had the chance to present, uh, to launch the initiative at the World Heritage Committee session in Bahrain uh, earlier this year. And we have the chance again to show progress on this agenda. And this is not different from the way the climate agenda evolved also over the years when it used to be the climate change agenda was simply an intergovernmental agenda. But now we all know that uh, the private sector and, in, and indeed the wider financial community of banks, insurers and investors are all part of this agenda and actually have a significant role to play. And it's exactly the same thing that's what's happening in the World Heritage Committee. It used to be simply a government agenda. Increasingly, there was uh, recognition that there is uh, uh, a, a role for companies and beyond um, companies is also financial institutions. Um, and, and that's really the, um, what we have uh, for you. Um, it's, it's really a, a work in progress and the start of this journey is, is really um, an expression of commitment saying, yes, we support this World Heritage Site um, initiative. And the expression of that um, support is uh, by being a signatory to the statement. And that will lead us um, to the next steps of, of, of developing guidance, exploring tools, um, together with yourselves, together with UNESCO, together with WWF. I just want to make sure that um, um, Barbara and Alma from WWS also have a chance to uh, share additional thoughts on the next steps. Uh, I may have uh, missed a few things, but uh, Barbara, perhaps uh, you can share uh, any thoughts uh, that you may want to share. Uh, thanks, Butch. Um, I don't think you've missed anything. Thanks, that was very um, insightful. Um, I just wanted to reiterate once more, um, we've been obviously discussing this also bilaterally with some insurance companies, and I just want to reiterate once more um, maybe the fear of signing up before you have all answers or be before you have all data available. Um, you should not have that fear. I can only reiterate once more again, also this is working progress and signing the statement means, you know, we will start to collaborate on, on 
what this really means on gui a guidance report and on figuring out any data gaps that exist. And WWF is absolutely um, looking forward to help solve these data gap problems because we do have some experience in, in building very relevant tools that I think could be quite helpful for the insurance sector. So no, just once more encouragement and a big thank you also for this collaboration with UNEPFI and UNESCO. I think it's quite a unique thing we're doing and um, we're very much looking forward to start working with insurance colleagues on this. Thanks. Right, so we'll, um, we have time uh, for questions. So we actually are ahead of time. So we wanna make sure that for those of you uh, on the webinar that um, for those of you who have any questions, uh, uh, now's a good time actually um, to, uh, to put them on the table if you have any questions. Um, do we see any hands? So I think um, it's clear. Um, there were uh, uh, questions uh, in the earlier webinar and past webinars, but I think um, uh, Barbara, Alma, and Guy, I think we've um, already um, improved uh, our <laughs> presentation skills after a couple of webinars. So I think we've become clearer and clearer after each webinar, which is great. And it's uh, a testament to it. Um, but I think uh, my parting shot for me is that I think this is really unique as an initiative. No one else is doing something like this. Even I think the initial engagement of WWF at banks was really more on uh, with certain companies, but this is really um, using the, the PSI as a collaborative initiative to actually be very proactive on this agenda. This, will, this is an issue that will not go away. Um, it's something that increasingly uh, will be um, uh, put on the table by different stakeholders, be it government or civil society or financial institutions themselves. I mean, I think increasingly we're seeing that uh, the, there's a recognition that uh, the, the way the financial system and financial market operates at the moment is that uh, there is an assumption that one can consume natural capital without limits. Uh, but I think we're, what we're seeing is that um, we are, our natural capital and uh, uh, are actually finite and we are already hitting planetary limits, whether it's on greenhouse gases or uh, extinction of species and biodiversity. And really at the very core of this are really that less than 1% of the Earth's surface that we are supposed to be protecting because they are prices and irreplaceable. And if those actually go away, um, then I think the, the sign of, uh, of sustainability would not be good. And this is one of the things that we hope um, insurers around the world can really champion. And this is a really unique opportunity for insurers around the world to show this really matters um, to us. We are here to be part of uh, the agenda of sustainability and to help protect um, these assets that matter most to us. So I think um, this is a good chance for everyone to be involved. Um, and obviously, we will communicate with you um, the next process. Uh, we'll be sending the recording and the slides to all members um, after this. We'll also um, mention again the next steps. The key deadline is the end of October to become a founding signatory. It's something that we will communicate widely. And we hope that many of you, and if not all of you, could be part of this agenda. And, and something that is quite exciting actually, because um, uh, guidance on this and understanding is still um, embryonic, I have to say. Uh, but I think together, I think the industry, um, together with UNESCO, WWF, and UNEP can actually make a difference. All right. Thank you so much uh, for your time and um, have a good day. Thank you all. Black hole. Hmm? 
What? Why are you laughing? Milena from Zigora said thanks for the opportunity. Ah. Oh, did she ask a question? No. no. 